podcast from the grassroots, connecting people and sharing ideas. Hey, this is Arlene, and you are listening to Duran Asian, the voice of discovery. Hi, this is Gauri. Hi. <laughs> so uh, today uh, we are going to talk about environmental issues. Just that's why I, I was playing a, a, a snippet bit of Akuna Matata, my favorite song. Uh, so today we are going to talk about what is uh, some environmental issues that are happening in Sabah, and we have SM Mutu, our regular s- speaker here today. He's going to share about. What is happening in Pitas? Apparently, there's a stream aquaculture there, and it's creating quite environmental costs. Before we start our conversation, welcome to uh, the studio. Hi, Esemutu. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful morning here in Kota Kinabalu. Oh, I, I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I'm sure Kota Kinabalu is beautiful, especially you know you have. One of the biggest, uh, one of the tallest, uh, highest uh, peak in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And uh, uh, we have just overcome a serious flood here. You oh, know, really? You did have. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have minor floods here as well on the roads. Uh, it's been yeah. raining quite some time since early this month. Yeah. So to to discuss about the aquaculture, stream aquaculture in Pitas, perhaps a bit of the background. What is it all about? Uh, you see, this area in Pitas actually was con- uh, was gazetted or rather reserved for aquaculture farming way back in 1983. 1983, but you know that was during the Bajaya State Government. And of course, during those days, the issue or rather the importance of mangrove swamps uh, to the environment was not there. You see, the knowledge was not that deep. So people say this is a good place for aquaculture. They reserve 9,000 acres for aquaculture. Nobody uh, remembered that. Everything was quiet. Then suddenly last year, we started, uh, people started moving big time. You see, mostly Aquacultures is a few 10 acres, 15 acres, 100 acres maybe the most, or 200 acres. That's it. Because aquaculture is not an easy uh, project, you know, uh, rather business because due to pollution, disease, you know, and all that. Anyway, this particular project, this started, there are several. There are some 1,005, some 1,000. And this particular one we are going to talk about today, actually, originally, they actually applied for 5,800 acres or rather 5,500 acres from the government. The land and survey, because it's all government related, the land and survey approved 4,000 for them to go in to demarcate the area, to survey the area, demarcate and come back. And finally, they had about more or less 3,800 acres and they started felling or rather clearing even before any approval was given. Mm-hmm. One thing I one thing I want I'm quite curious. Who are the developers or those uh, that actually are part of this project? See, it, this is all like Alibaba issue. The state government approved the land to Yayasan Sabah, and Yayasan Sabah is a body set up to bring benefits to the people of Sabah. Has they been doing, so, based on what uh, they're supposed to do, bringing benefits of Sabah? Project, in this particular, uh, Yasan Sabah has had so many projects. In the old days, it was felt, it was really felt that what Yasan Sabah did, sending poor students to school, over, overseas to West Malaysia and all that. But somehow, by and by, the mm-hmm. income from the forest, that's where they get their main income from the forest. The income somehow dwindled. Only God knows what happened to that, why it dwindled. And the cost of uh, serving the people increased. And also God knows why some of the services are so expensive. So it's, it, the service is still there to the people, but not as good as before because there is a lot of leakage here and there. You know, So that causes things to be you know, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming back to Pitas, what the Yasan Sabah did was they went into a joint venture with the 
Peninsula Company. What is the company? So, is it called Sedia? Uh, no, no, Sedia is the uh, is the body under this uh, all this uh, uh, transformation Sedia. But they actually went into a private something. It sounds something like sunlight, you know, from Perak. Mm -hmm. uh, sunlight, uh, a fish, uh, fishing industry or something. Sunlight fishing or sunlight aquaculture, something like that. So I don't want to be very specific anyway. Uh, they went into joint venture. That company came in, had a manager. As I said, we did not object to the project. We object to the way they are doing it. Even before approval came in, they already felled the mangrove uh, trees, you know. It was full of beautiful mangrove trees. Now, you see, in any uh, such project, when the land and survey gives uh, uh, approval in principle and, and gives you the area to go in and survey and demarcate, you survey, demarcate, and then you have to say whether there are any villages inside the area, you have to cut them out, and then you have to come back, give your survey plans to the land and survey, they will look at it and then give you a final approval, uh, letter of uh, uh, approval, together with conditions, what you can do, what you cannot do, and how to do it, do that. And in this particular case, uh, being aquaculture, you still have to take the approval and go to the Environmental Protection Department. And they will tell you environmentally what are the things you have to do, environmental impact assessment, what kind of it you have to do, the ordinary one or the detailed one or the special one. And you have to wait for that. You have to go through the process because this is the environment you're talking about. The but environment there, is gone. You has there been any consultation done between the local communities, uh, the environmentalists there, as well with the ones developing the aquaculture? Uh, before they started the project, none. During the project, also none. People protested. They just ignored them. Only when it came out on the front page of the newspaper, they hurried to pay the compound. Environmental Protection Department, we have an excellent department here with the staff here. They went and uh, what they call compound them for doing work without approval. But they never bothered. They continued work. Then when it came out on the front page, second time, someone managed to put it on the front page of the local paper. Then they stopped. Then they start paying the compound, you see. Mm -hmm. It's all that I don't have to listen to others. I do what I like because I'm with the government. You know, something like that. I'm with the government. I'm doing a semi-government project, something like that. In fact, I always tell them, being a government-related project or semi-government-related project, you should set a standard, the example for others to follow. Follow in the sense of following all the rules, regulations, bylaws, you know, environmental requirements and all that. And you become a standard, especially Yasan Sabah. Yasan Sabah has been carrying the flag in terms of educating, bringing education to the rural and poor people. Why should they go into a project like this and destroy the environment? Mm -hmm. And for them, um, what is their focus right now that you are aware of? Are they still continuing the, uh, the aquaculture? Or, or have they gone to the stage where they have completed uh, all the infrastructure and they are going doing business if, as usual? They, if you ask them, they say no. Stop work order, nothing is being done. But they thought they are already operating about approximately 14 ponds, aquaculture ponds. They are already operating. But we had a meeting, EIA meeting. I was in the panel June 5th this year, early this year. It happened to be World Environment Day, June 5th. And I casually, I didn't know at that time, I casually asked, hey, you all started work? And he, the manager said no. But only a few days later, I found out they have 14 ponds ponds there and the EPD knew about it. That's why they summoned them. You know? But they seem to pull big names. Whenever enforcement officers go there, they pull big names. Oh, we have so and so behind us. Oh, so and so is a partner here. Big timers from Smenanjung. See? The original reason or the concept why they came up with this project is to uplift the economic standing of the locals. You know, PITAS, uh, if you go Google, you read some news on PITAS, it's the poorest part of Sabah. Mm -hmm. And in so, uh, in, and due to that, it's actually, it can actually be regarded as the poorest part of Malaysia. 
Yeah. When you talk about let, let's talk about the society, the local communities there. You said that it is yeah. the poor, the poorest part of Sabah. If you can describe their day-to-day lives, how poor they are, what would that be? Oh, many of the villages don't have water. Mm-hmm. They don't have electricity. Oh, they don't they, have electricity at all. Yes. So every the night they actually use candles and. Yes, some of the villages, some the the line, the electricity line just passes them by to other places. They don't want to provide, what for whatever reasons only they know. And when you no. say they don't anyway, have access to clean water, so what kind of water they are currently using for rain their day to day? Rainwater. So they do rainwater yes. harvesting. Yes, they do rainwater harvesting, and they have to get a big plastic water tanks. You know. There are also some good Samaritans groups here and there, uh, whether it's church groups or community groups or, you know, they provide, they try to supply them also. And of course, sometimes you get the one Malaysia water tanks you know, <laughs> during election time. I see. And yeah. besides that, uh, what about yeah. economically, how do they fare? What kind of work they do? Yeah. Economically, that's why some of them, a few of them, they do work in a Safoda. Safoda is doing the aqua, 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 sorry, uh, acacia plant, plantations. The area is actually surrounded by acacia plantations. So some of them work there, a few of them. Uh, uh, so most of them, they find a living uh, going, looking for food in the river, in the swamp, you know, shellfish, small fish, crabs. That's how they survive. On. They're very simple people. I mean, it's very difficult for us to talk in this 21st century and think of such people, how they live. Only if you go there and see them, then you realize. And they're very contented people. Mm-hmm. Poverty, we measure in our terms. But if you look at themselves, they're quite happy as long as you leave them alone. And only the only thing the government should provide is opportunity for education, infrastructure, road, medical, that's it. But if you go there and take, grab their lands, grab the forest, the forest is their, something like their pharmacy. They know which plants to take for what uh, sickness, you know. And their food basket is also that they're hungry, they go to the river, catch some fish, get some selfish and all that. So their backyard you know? is uh, practically their refrigerator. Like everything yes. is there. Everything is there. So, so that's why I feel I went there and I almost came to tears looking at them. So simple. And this, the, the moment they see you, they give you the broader smile, you know. Even though they're half, uh, you know, knee deep in the river, trying to get the selfish, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's something we have to measure development in not according to our standards and our level, but according to their standard. In Malaysia, uh, in in Peninsula Malaysia, it's unheard of when it comes to communities not getting electricity, adequate electricity, access to clean water, and of course to to be to to be so struggle in life, especially if you are living in the urban area, have there been any government efforts to create more access points to these communities to ensure that they can receive at least a basic standard of living? Well, if they want to do and they're sincere about it, it can be done. It's not too difficult. It's not too difficult. But they is it, already, it uh, the, the Pitas area, is it located in a very remote area in Sabah or is it like very near to uh, certain uh, towns? It's not really that. It used to be remote, but now it's all open up because of oil palm plantations all around. So it is, even this village, uh, Kampong Iloy, uh, uh, it's on the Sungai Iloy. You, you can reach there. Uh, the nearest town is Pitas town itself, which has a, which has an administrative center with a district officer and all that, it can be reached. It's gravel right up to Pitas. From there to this village, about 10, 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers, part of it is gravel, you know, uh, quite bad roads at uh, certain points. But whenever there's a development, the government puts in electricity, even like to the prawn uh, farm, you know, there's electricity supply, there's good gravel road, part of it seal and all that. But when it comes to villages, you know, they think they they don't have to spend the money, especially if the people, these villages, are very quiet type, contented type. They don't complain. They don't grumble, you know. So what can we do? Mm-hmm. 
That's so, why groups like us go in to try to at least protect what they have been depending on, you see. Mm-hmm. Right now, uh, what are the the, the the feedback from the villagers? What have they the done villagers, so far? If you, if you tell them what exactly is happening, of course, they're not happy. For, for instance, I asked the government people, whoever decided on this, mm-hmm. if you really want to uplift the income of those local people and you want to introduce aquaculture, why don't you introduce a cooperative method? Why don't you give each family, you know, do a survey, take, uh, take stock of all the poor families, give them three acres each or even five acres each and join it together in a cooperative and run the cooperative. If they are not capable, you bring in the expert, you run the cooperative, give them their dues, uh, their dividends every year. And for those who work on the prawn farm, you give them a wage. So they are both owners and workers and they learn. It, you, they can't learn overnight. It takes years to learn. Probably after that, they can become independent aquaculture farmers. And then you have to, most important is the environment. Most important is the environment. You have to say whatever you do. I think they are more uh, uh, more concerned about the environment. They know when the environment goes, they go. Mm-hmm. You know, some of them are even pagans, but they value and respect nature. Mm-hmm. So it, there's no problem. You see, this one, a lot of us, a lot, some of the people we spoke to, they said that there's a federal grant of 400 over million. Oh, that's a lot of money. Is, uh, a lot of money under SIDIA or SIDA or something, you know, all those uh, transformation programs. So the federal government puts in the money, but how the money is used here is a different matter. You see, did did you think that the federal government has failed in doing its monitoring of where the money goes? I don't think probably whether they are actually monitoring or actually in 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 a way it goes back to certain uh, to to serve the interests of certain federal leaders we don't know mm-hmm. because even if we have proof they will find us at fault you see uh, uh, I don't want to say things which I, uh, I cannot be cannot be proven but we know it happened there you know one son of a federal leader came in and said this is our project. Mm-hmm. No, so what would, can we do? With uh, the current model of the aqua, uh, the stream aquaculture benefit the local communities in, in any way? They always say, oh, they can work in the, on the prawn farm. You see, as I said earlier, you should look at development and life from their perspective. Let us not judge them from our perspective. These are free people, free. Life is free to them. They can do what they like as long as they don't harm people. They don't, they're harmless people. They live a beautiful life. Here you go and open a prawn farm, you say, I offer you a job. When they are not so good in the beginning, you scold them, you sack them. You know, these things happen. Oh, you're no good, you're lazy. It's not easy for native races, orang asal, orang asli, to change overnight. It takes generations. And these people, I, I, I will tell you what will happen. This aquaculture farm, you see, the water has to be treated. And even after treatment, you cannot pump it into the river because you will there is accumulative uh, uh, pollution, you know, whatever the chemicals, the, um, the medicine, and the or whatever is pumped into the river. Even after treatment, there's an accumulative effect. It will destroy life in the river. So that's why, for us, I was representing uh, Malaysian Nature Society in the EIA. I only suggested that the discharge be into the sea, deeper part of the sea, so that the river won't be affected. Otherwise, what will happen is they will do the farm, and the prone farm normally after it becomes too polluted, they abandon, or because they have to spend a lot of money to clean it. So normally they will abandon, move to another place. But the river will be polluted. All the life will be dead, and the villagers will be in a worse-off situation because they can't find their food. Mm-hmm. The river is dead. Mm. And, and I... When the, from what I am re- reading from the earlier reports uh, in the newspaper, yeah. the mangrove forest will also wipe up the natural, uh, be wiped up, uh, especially the natural resources that are being collected by the villagers uh, for their daily livelihoods. Would that be yes. true? And yes, how how it would is true. how would it uh, affect the mangrove forest there? Uh, this particular area. Uh, much of it has already been chopped down. And this particular kampong who came to us for help, I sent them to the department and association last year. 
I thought the problem was settled. Recently, they came back to us again. What happened is that they complain. And then because there was so much of complaint, they say, okay, we don't include your area. So about a few hundred acres were left out. So they left. I think at the moment now, they're doing only about 2,800 acres. But they had already fell all the mangrove trees. So it's barren. It's open, barren. Are they going to come back and replant the mangrove in this kampong area? The village, one of the villagers who is very outspoken, he came, he said, normally every morning they go into the forest, they look for food, this and that. Now all the trees are down, barren. So he asked me, how can we find our food? Mm-hmm. If they go to the, you see, the government also, even the district officers, this and that, whoever they are, when these people go them go to them to help, they are duty bound or rather young menurut perintah. They are ordered by the higher ups to to help with the project, to let the project go on without any hindrance, even if they don't follow the law. You know, we have cases where they did not they did not follow the law. We complain, but no action is taken except for the Environment Protection Department. The forestry has not taken action on the mangrove that was you know, brought down and then they must have been removed. They never did any investigation. All they said is, we look into it, that's mm-hmm. it. And then the land and survey should have taken, uh, uh, compounded them because they moved in and started work even before the uh, title was issued to them. Mm-hmm. It seems they, like they break all the laws under the sun. Yeah, it seems like the reality in Sabah, uh, the, the the power is very much centralized compared to probably the, the the urban areas in peninsula where the people has more say on this. If you are talking about the solution, uh, at least from the people's side to address the issue of pitas, what would that be? As I said, abandon the project. This developer has shown from day one that he does not respect the law and he takes Sabahans to be idiots. You know? They just do what they want to do. So but how are you going to bring the issue the project, forward? Uh, if the government wants to do it, they can do it. But if the government have other plans you know, with vested interest, we, we, the people have to keep on protesting. Mm-hmm. See, as I said earlier, teach the people how to, run, uh, how to operate a Prawn farm, small one, one acre, two acre or so will do. You, you don't need 1,000, 2,000. Because your objective, as you say, is to what? Up, to to uplift, uplift the, the livelihood of the people. Uh, and it's a, one of the poorest areas in Sabah, if not yes, in Malaysia. Yes. yes. Well, if you give, me the, if you give uh, some associations the fund, give us. We can do it. Mm-hmm. Give us the fund. We can teach them. We can show them how to run the aquaculture. We can actually build a pipeline out to the deeper part, if necessary. Uh, I mean, if the project is necessary. Otherwise, if we do the project, we will make sure that the discharge goes into the deeper part of the mm-hmm. sea. So management is definitely one of the real challenges that the government is facing right now because they don't seem to understand how much power the people can actually uh, do in terms of being more self-determined of their own livelihood. Um they, yes. they, they definitely underestimate uh, the power of the people, it seems like. Uh, yes, uh, power of the people. But please, when you say you want to do something good, mean it you know, and do it mm-hmm. with the meaning. Not just use it. It looks very beautiful on paper. Oh, federal government is pouring 400 million or 420 million uh, aquaculture, uplift the income, the livelihood of the Pitas people. At the end of the day, what will happen? Mm-hmm. You know, We can foresee but they're only interested in the money, the grant. When the grant is, you know, drawn down and the project is, uh, get, the place gets polluted, they'll just abandon, scuttle and go off. I have, we have examples of large prawn, prawn farms which have been abandoned. I live right in front of a prawn farm. There was a government operated from prawn farm. They just abandoned it. Mm-hmm. few hundred acres. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our show, but I wish we can talk more about it maybe on a later date when there's more development on how uh, the the, uh, the stream aquaculture is being handled by both uh, the government, the, uh, the, the, the developers, as well as the local community. So, uh, SM uh, Mutu, thank you very much uh, for sharing this. Do you have a this- minute? Sorry? Do you have a, f- a couple of seconds? Yeah, I also you want can, to you say can end. Yeah, there's you can a end lot your... of secrecy. 
Mm-hmm. There's a lot of secrecy in the project. I attended a EIA meeting on June 5th. I asked for a minute. They refused to give. They, they refused to even answer my email. Then I asked my lawyer to write in, and then finally they replied on 17th of October. They said EIA has not been approved. Whereas we know that EIA has, has been approved without our knowledge, the offer has been given to the developer, but the developer is still trying to negotiate to get away from some of the requirements. I hope, I sincerely hope, the Environmental Protected Protection Department, together with the Minister, Dato Masidi Manjun, will not give in to the developer. They must follow all the regulations. Mm. And in fact, they should find the developer. In fact, they should sack the developer because he started work without any approval. Mm. With that, thank you very much. Thank you.